thanks everyone for uh, for coming back. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm an editor here at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and welcome to the next panel of uh, our conference, Rosa Luxemburg at 150. Uh, the topic of this panel is Rosa Luxemburg's reception on the Asian continent. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to our chair, Sobhanlal Dadagupta. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, on behalf of International Rosa Luxemburg Society Berlin, I uh, welcome all of you, the four panelists, the viewers, and uh, those of you who are uh, watching this program uh, live on Facebook. And all of you know that the occasion is a celebration of uh, 150th uh, birth anniversary of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, I will, first of all, uh, very briefly uh, say a few words about the structure of this panel. We have four panelists, and uh, I will announce them uh, in order. Uh, what I propose to do is, and this is how we have organized the panel, uh, each speaker uh, will speak, say, for about 15 minutes, because we have to operate within a very strict time schedule. So each speaker will speak for 15 minutes and uh, each presentation then will be followed by uh, questions uh, which you are free to raise uh, on your, the Facebook chat. And then the questions will be communicated to the speakers. But the problem is that uh, we will not have much time for discussion. Uh, and we, I do not want to cut down the uh, time of the speaker. So maybe for we will not be able to uh, entertain all the questions. Maybe we have to be rather selective in our choice of questions. But let us see how many questions or what kind of questions we get. This is my uh, first announcement. And my second announcement is that, well, uh, this is the order. We have four speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Michael Pretke. Uh, uh, he is actually uh, located, as far as I know, he is located in Amsterdam. I do not know exactly now where he is. Uh, his uh, presentation uh, will be followed by uh, the presentation from China, uh, Dr. Xiongmin. Uh, then that presentation will be followed by uh, the presentation from South Korea, uh, Professor Sivok Chang, and the fourth presentation will be Ravi Kumar, uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar from uh, India. And now, before I uh, invite the panelists, the first speaker is Michelle Kretke. I would like to say uh, just a few words about the theme of this panel, because uh, Rosa Luxemburg, as all of you know, she was, after all, was European. She wrote in uh, Polish and German. So uh, viewers may wonder that how, why we have uh, picked up uh, this kind of theme. Did, was Rosa Luxemburg really interested in uh, Asia? Was she interested in non-European countries? So I would very briefly make just uh, two observations on the uh, justification of this uh, theme that we have chosen for this panel. The first thing is that uh, Rosa Luxemburg actually throughout her life was uh, deeply interested uh, and extremely curious about uh, the situation in the Northern Western societies. In, 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 in fact, she, uh, in a letter, in fact, there are many writing, but I'm just by way of illustration. I'm referring to a letter written by Rosa Luxemburg to Kostya Setkin, uh, dated 17th July, uh, 1909, 1909. Uh, uh, Kostya Setkin was the son of Clara Setkin. And there in that letter, uh, she pointed out uh, very interestingly that the Europeans, uh, do not uh, care to take note of the fact that in 
uh, Assyria and Babylon. In fact, she describes it at the uh, Babylonian Assyrian uh, civilization. The kind of uh, contribution that it made to world culture and civilization. And Europeans are still proud of uh, simply Greece and Rome. But long before Greece and Rome, uh, what kind of contributions these uh, Asian civilizations made, and we should take note of that. This is just one illustration. The other is in her very famous work. This, in fact, this will be discussed today later in the presentations. In the accumulation of capital, uh, written in uh, 1913, then Eunice pamphlet, uh, 1915. In these and many other writings, but I'm referring to these two particular pamphlets just by way of example. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg actually focused on, in her own way, the problem of imperialism and colonialism, how imperialism and colonialism, they have plundered, they loot the uh, non-European countries, non-Western societies, what consequences the people of these countries have to face. So she made a very detailed analysis of colonialism, imperialism in her own way. And so it, it, it's not correct to uh, argue that Rosa Luxemburg simply was uh, European, that as if she had a Eurocentric mind. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a completely different story, actually, if we go through Rosa Luxemburg's writings, her letters, etc. Anyway, so that shows why that explains, in fact, why we have chosen this uh, particular theme. And uh, before I invite the first speaker, Michelle Gretke, I would like to add just one small point uh, regarding the structure of the panel. After all the presentations and discussions are made, well, I will make uh, just a few observations by way of conclusion. And with that, we will wrap up this session. And this session, uh, as uh, we have uh, been told by the organizers, it should more or less uh, uh, continue for about 90 minutes. So this is how we have scheduled the program. I will now invite our first speaker, uh, Professor Michel Krejke, Rosa Luxemburg's heterodox view of the global south. Uh, Professor Krejke is Emeritus Professor Lancaster University, UK, and a visiting professor, Tokohu University, Sedai, Japan. So, over to Professor Michel Gretke, Rosa Luxemburg's heterodox view of the global south. Thank you very much. I would like to focus upon the already mentioned work, The Accumulation of Capital, published for the first time in 1913. That was a work that Rosa Luxemburg herself regarded as a most important, a primary work, or opus magnum as I say in, in Latin. Uh, in particular, I will focus upon the section three of this book. I will not give you a full description uh, because in this section, she deals explicitly with the problem of colonialism, imperialism. In just six chapters, this is a rather few chapters because in total, the book has 32 chapters about a quarter, less of a quarter of the whole is devoted to the analysis of imperialism, colonialism, just uh, less than 100 pages of 450, depending upon the edition you use. Uh, well, there is an uh, agreement among Marxist economists ever since the book has been published. Uh, it contains a big flaw in the argument. Uh, but also, as I would like to argue, some surprising insights which are very much at odds with conventional wisdom, especially among Marxists. First, as Rosa Luxemburg argues, colonialism, imperialism is a solution to an inherent problem, uh, a problem that in her view is intrinsic to the capitalist accumulation uh, process uh, which produces, according to Luxembourg, an ever-growing surplus of commodities 
a surplus that cannot be sold because of a lack of effective demand. Uh, and that can only be compensated by uh, non-capitalist areas, non-capitalist economies and societies, which introduces into the framework of Marxist, capital, uh, Marxist uh, political economy. And she sees the uh, expansion of capitalism into those non-capitalist areas as necessary and as the one and only solution to the problem she has identified. Well, the problem as she sees it is, uh, isn't, doesn't exist in the uh, analysis of the accumulation uh, process, but just let's assume it, she is right. She isn't, but anyway, uh, then there is uh, an, a process that she does analyze in some detail uh, the move of modern capitalism, European capitalism, and North American capitalism into the so-called non-capitalist world. Uh, but she immediately runs into a problem. And that is that exactly that, the problem that she sees shows that he is a, she was a brilliant mind because she sees that the non-capitalist economies and societies as they existed, before colonialism, uh, imperialism, were actually not fit for purpose. They were not able to solve the problem as she sees it. They cannot absorb a surplus of commodities produced in the advanced capitalist world for lack of need, for lack of efficient, uh, effective demand. Uh, this insight, which is basic for the accumulation, for the analysis of colonialism and imperialism, leads her to uh, some consequences, quite important. Uh, she focuses upon them in these six chapters. How can the uh, uh, advanced capitalist world uh, make those non-capitalist economies and societies fit for purpose? so that they can actually serve as a solution to the problem. Her answer is straightforward, by large scale transformation of these societies and economies, which are non-capitalist in the sense of non-natural uh, economies, subsistence economies, peasant economies, as they ca she called them, with some market uh, elements, um, this is only possible, she proceeds, by extensive investment from the colonizers. So she runs into the problem already well known in the 19th century, even well known to Marx and many other political economists, of the high cost uh, of colonial enterprises. Um, Destruction as such is not enough. Conquering is not enough. Conquering will give you some plunder, some spoils of war, but not what the colonialism, imperialism in uh, Luxembourg's view is after. So you need a sustained long-term effort in order to transform these societies and economies. And that means a large scale and sustained uh, investment. Rosa Luxemburg points to that, uh, to this crucial uh, argument made by the bulk, the large majority of all serious economic historians today, the rising cost of colonialism in the long run, in the short run as well. And she comes very close to realizing the contradictions of modern colonialism. Uh, there is a lot of expansion. Yes, there is a race for resources but there is also a huge and ever increasing burden and even loss uh, for the colonizing of the agents of colonization, which are first and foremost, the states and some uh, uh, colonial entrepreneurs, which are normally supported by their states. Uh, there are losses, there are pr no profits for the state, no gains. 
Uh, on the contrary, there is a rising cost of protection of these newly uh, acquired territories. Rosa Luxemburg goes further and further, although uh, the last chapters, unfortunately, are very sketchy and very unsystematic, but she shows how this works in some detail, not in all detail. For instance, she so shows that the cost, the rising cost of colonial investment when it comes to, well, building ports, building roads, building infrastructure, building new factories, etc. So what we call today in a shorthand developing these countries or these areas uh, is financed by large scale international oh. loans, which means that first you have to need a massive capital export into these colonies in order to make uh, the commodity, the, the export of commodities from the advanced capitalist world into their colonies possible at all. So this is a precondition and it has a lot of uh, implications. There are several uh, serious lacunae in uh, Rosa Luxemburg's argument. Unfortunately, uh, she does not or she does uh, uh, deal with very briefly with the problem of colonial trade where actually uh, the people of the advanced capitalist uh, societies and economies are in the homelands are those who are exploited. Yes, and also people, indigenous people in the colonies uh, because of massive use of forced labor or slavery, outright slavery. This is the one big missing point in uh, Rosa Luxemburg's analysis. Um, so just indicating that she starts with a remarkable insight. Uh, she goes into the uh, very uh, core of the problem uh, the con very contradictory nature of what we call colonialism, imperialism. She does not really deal with these concepts as concepts, and she completely ignores or doesn't simply refuses to engage with the debate that already existed in, in particular in Europe, in particular in Germany, among social democrats, among Marxists, about colonialism, imperialism. Uh, so she does not differentiate as the others already did, uh, which is, a, again, a big disadvantage of her approach to colonialism, imperialism. What I think is missing, first and foremost, uh, although she is at the brink of analyzing it, are the political reasons for uh, the colonial and imperialist uh, enterprises. And these are the rivalries between the big powers. Some of the big powers were more reluctant than others. Uh, I quote in my paper, the famous saying of uh, Chancellor Bismarck, Chancellor of the first German empire, who said, well, we are not rich enough to engage in these colonial enterprises because he was aware of the high and rising cost of imperialism. Uh, a very last chapter dealing with militarism is loosely linked to uh, the phenomenon of imperialism, which did entail massive investment in uh, the armies, the armament, uh, in uh, uh, military expeditions, etc. But she only analyzes this within the context of cap advanced capitalist economies. So this is one of the core criticisms against her uh, opus magnum. She does not only miss the core point uh, in the economic analysis of the uh, accumulation process. She does see a very, this is a very strong point. She does see the tricky, the uh, contradictory nature of colonial imperialist adventures. And she misses the point of the big rivalries between the great powers in Europe and later on uh, the United States also joined at the end of the 19th century. So then you have a real race for the rest of the world that should be colonized. And the race is uh, triggered by the simple fact that there are some uh, big powers, uh, European big powers, 
that already have a head start, like the British Empire, and the others follow a little bit. But this is a core element of any analysis of imperialism, which is not just an, a problem of capitalism as an economic system, but much more, uh, or at least at the same degree, a problem uh, of the European state system as it was in the 19th century and until, let's say, the end of World War II. Okay, I hope I made some sharp points. Uh, and if you want to know more, we can discuss it and you can read it briefly in my paper, which will be expanded into a large chapter in the forthcoming book on Rosa Luxemburg as a political economist, which she was first and foremost, according to herself. She saw herself not as many Marxists see her today uh, as a political theorist, she saw herself as a political economist. Okay, thank you very much for your patience and attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Kretke, for your presentation. Uh, now, uh, be be before I, 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 I don't know what questions have been raised in the Facebook chat, but one question has come in the Zoom chat. Uh, but I, I, I think that, that question I should answer. Uh, the question okay. has the question is this, what was the assessment of Rosa Luxemburg about the Indian communists? Now, uh, my answer is that actually Rosa looks, okay, uh, okay, Rosa Luxemburg actually, when she was writing, as long as she was alive, uh, the Indian uh, Communist Party had not yet been formed. Mm -hmm. And Indian Communist Party uh, movement actually was uh, almost in the stage of infancy. So she had absolutely no idea of uh, what kind of left movement was bringing up in India. So, but she was otherwise interested. She, she has uh, some in accumulation of capital in her say uh, uh, party class lecture notes. There are stray references to India. She was aware of the yes. colonial plunder, plunder of India. Yes, yes, but, but uh, this uh, she, she, at that time actually the the time had not yet come for Rosa Luxemburg to make any assessment of what kind of uh, left movement was going up in India. So uh, okay, so till now uh, we have got just one question from the Facebook. Maybe let let, let us uh, go on. Let us take up the second presentation, and if we have time, let may, maybe. Uh, at the end of all the four presentations, some other questions may come up, then we will take them up. So thank you again, uh, Professor Kretke, and uh, for your presentation. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Xiongmin from China. Uh, what can Rosa Luxemburg tell us about being an intellectual today? Uh, Dr. Xiangmin is actually uh, attached to the School of Marxism, Zhongdan University of Economics and Law, Wuhan, China. So, okay. Xiong uh, Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you, guys. So, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to make some clarifications. The first one is that although my topic is about what can Russell Luxburg tell us about being an intellectual today, actually, um, I don't want to uh, deal with it or talking about this from a theoretical or academic uh, uh, ways, because uh, my, I, I think uh, my personal experience during the last one year, uh, maybe uh, maybe will help me to think about this question. So yes, the, uh, my speech will uh, totally will major based on my personal experience. And then uh, I'd like to uh, do another clarification. So if I criticize in this speech, uh, it does not mean that I'm an uh, extreme descendant 
uh, from China. So rather, uh, this criticize, uh, criticism is a gentle reflection and criticism of an educator uh, from within the system uh, about myself, uh, about China and the globalized world. And, and then I also like to clarify that I do not present anyone else. I do not present China, present Wuhan. Uh, I just present myself. Okay. So China seems to have achieved uh, achieved the victory uh, against the epidemic, uh, but I must admit that for me, uh, there is not much joy except uh, um, several a few situations, just like with my kids or talking with my friends. The long term sadness, anxiety, and other emotions are not only uh, unable to be released under the narrative of victory, but also are not allowed to be released. So in fact, I feel that I'm suffering some kind of uh, disaster uh, sequelae. I don't know the pronunciation of whether it's right. So uh, it's majorly manifested in that how much I want to face myself and sort me uh, out, then how many times I used uh, various excuses to escape from and delay it. So therefore, when Mr. Sabana Dato Gupta invited me to participate in this symposium uh, as one of the speakers, I accepted uh, uh, without hesitation, because I desperate, desperately lead a, uh, how to say that, lead a force, lead a push uh, from an external uh, to push me to face myself, to channel and to heal myself by speaking out. So here, uh, I'd like to thank uh, this meeting uh, for providing me an opportunity to sort out myself. And also as a manifestation of my disaster, uh, sequelae, uh, this written edition of speech uh, was not completed until the death night. Uh, okay, so after uh, this clarification, uh, although uh, I have some observations uh, in my written edition to uh, share with you. I think uh, because of the time limited, I'll just go directly to uh, offer myself as a specimen to be uh, dissected uh, so that, uh, how to say that, uh, to make myself uh, face the question about uh, what will be uh, intellectual and what can we do? Uh, what's the dilemma of an intellectual at present? Okay. So I think to understand the world, to understand what intellectual to uh, do and should do in the world, uh, perhaps the very first thing to do is to understand myself. So who am I? Uh, I was born, live, and work in Wuhan. Uh, I'm a single mother with three children, a member of the Communist Party of China, and a college teacher. Um, born into an ordinary working class family in China's planned economy, I grew up in the era of reform and opening up and achieved a small class leap through my own efforts and relatively uh, equal educational opportunities to become a member of the higher educational system. So on one hand, this leap has made my income stable and at a middle level, I have more leisure time 
and higher social status and even produces a sense of superiority and satisfaction to some extent. On the other hand, because of this stratum's dependence on the system and its middle position, I'm prone to have a sense of insecurity and worry about gain and loss in social fluctuations and change. Uh, in addition, because I was born at the bottom, this leap made me naturally feel guilty towards the bottom and naturally pay attention to and get close to the bottom. However, the paradox is that I, who has achieved a class jump, a class leap, have developed a sense of beauty and alienation from the bottom of life at the same time. And that is to say, um, I miss it, but I can no longer synchronize it, uh, synchronize with it. And I know exactly, if not necessarily, I can no longer build that kind of life. So because of this uh, gradual distance, when I want to speak from the perspective, perspective uh, and position of the bottom, there may be misinterpretations or misunderstandings of the bottom. What is even more paradoxical is that the bottom class I came from does not represent all the bottom groups. It also means that I have a complete isolation and aphasia with other bottom groups. Just as uh, Luxburg once wrote in her letter that she did not understand the peasant issues at all. And, and also this epidemic has aggravated my often contradictory state. At the phenomenal level, it's manifested as fear of death and shame of being alive. Dependence on the powerful rescue force embodied by centralization and dissatisfaction with the powerful rescue force uh, with the suppression on freedom of speech by centralized power. Making a living as a teacher, as Luxburg calls it, one of the affiliated classes and contempt and dissatisfaction with the indoctrinating ideological education. The design for certainty and the sense of panic and emptiness that accompany the uncertain reality. The natural closeness with the bottom class I came from and the worries about their populist tendencies. So the torment of this contradictory, uh, contradictory state and the social division highlighted around Fang Fang's diary. Uh, I, I don't know whether you know, know her. She is a famous uh, Chinese writer and become more famous when uh, she, her diary published on internet and be published into English first, okay? So uh, all these things prompt me to reflect on the relationship between intellectuals and ideology. First of all, just like Feng Feng, everyone has to think in the specific environment he or she is in. This kind of thinking is sometimes one-sided, distorted, and even false. However, the right to think independently cannot be canceled for approaching the truth 
requires precisely, precisely such concrete thinking that is imperfect but sincere. Attacking and even prohibiting the right of such thinking that is imperfect uh, because of uh, conditions will only lead to insincere thinking and ultimately move to the greatest degree of distortion and falsehood. Furthermore, there is a paradoxical tension between telling the truth itself and ideological lies. Intellectuals, intellectuals usually pursue the truth as it is, while ideology often leads to attack, denigrate, and obligate the formal, for, uh, formal truth with the selected truth. This means that although we are in the ideology and cannot get rid of its influence, at least we must realize that we are affected and try not to be completely controlled by it. By drawing a certain distance from it through self-education and overall thinking. Perhaps, some specific historical event and even the involving of human society as a whole can be described as victory. However, intellectuals should never walk into the ranks of blindly cheering for victory without reservation, but should always be the one who says there is no victory at all. The mission of intellectuals is to maintain this abundance, to maintain the balance of contradictions as the antithesis of power and to avoid the absolute depotism and social enemy due to only one voice. In this sense, revisiting Luxburg's on the Russian Revolution cannot be more appropriate. In fact, it answers a conundrum I face. The narration of China's victory today should be regarded same as Luxburg's attitude toward the Russian Revolution. Both with phrase and criticism, otherwise Luxburg's prediction of socialism or barbarism will come true again. So someone anonymous said, yearlies should not separate people. On the contrary, it should provide opportunities for humans to love each other. And Luxburg wrote in a letter, everything would be much easier to live through if only I would not forget the basic rule I've made for my life. To be kind and good is the main thing. Plainly and simply to be good. That resolves and unites everything and is better than all cleverness and insistence on being right. At present, what could we say more than that. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Professor Xiongming, for your uh, presentation and um, for keeping your presentation limited to our stipulated time, that is 15 minutes. So, um, uh, till now, I, if, if there, yes, yes. There is one question for Professor Xiongmin. Uh, I, I, can, can, can you read the question or I will re read it for you? Well, let, let, me, let, let me read it out for you. Uh, okay, do you, 
can can you read it? Do you think intellectuals can be effective outside of political organizations, or do they have a responsibility to share their knowledge with a collective or a party? Uh, actually, um, you know, I'm always in an anxiety and speechless situation during the last one year uh, because many, many, many things. So um, after that, uh, after my, uh, I'm, when I'm beginning to rebuild in my worldview, what I'm thinking is about my profe uh, profession, uh, uh, how, to say that, how to say that, as a teacher. So right now what I'm thinking uh, I, I can do is that to try to influence my students to try to uh, not to just uh, criticize or just um, to dissatisfied with this uh, job. Uh, maybe it's, it's also kind of slowly influenced. So right now, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's my answer. Mm. So uh, in, in fact, we have got some uh, questions later uh, for Professor Kretke. Uh, we will take them up later after this the first round is over. Uh, anyway, without wasting any time, I would now uh, like to invite Professor Sivok Chan from South Korea, uh, he will speak on Rosa Luxembourg's reception uh, and impact in Korea. Uh, professor Sivok Chang is a professor at Mokpo National University, South Korea. So I would like to invite Professor Sivok Chang to make his presentation on Rosa Luxembourg's reception and impact in Korea. Professor Sivok Chang. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes. Today, uh, I will present under the title Rosa Luxembourg's Reception and Impact in Korea. Marxism was introduced in Korea during the Japanese colonial period, and up to present day, it has given many inspirations to theoretical uh, critique of capitalism and practical movements towards socialism. But it has subjected to strong suppression by the regime, especially military dictatorship governments. Thus, the reception of it was a history of suppression and resist. To discuss it, I will divide the history of reception of Marxism in Korea into several stages. Uh, firstly, impl implementation of Marxism under the domination of Japanese imperialism. Secondly, the first spring of Marxism after the liberation from Japanese colonial rule. Thirdly, the suppression and containment. And finally, the second spring of Marxism during the late 1980s. I will describe the, the uh, characteristic of the, uh, the recession of Marxism and Luxembourg's thought at each stage. stage. Also, I will examine the significance of the recession of it. <clears throat> Marxism has uh, been accepted along with various socialist thought since the early 1920s during the Japanese colonial period. At the time, Marxism was introduced in major da uh, daily newspapers such as uh, Donga Ilbo and Joseon Ilbo. Uh, can you? So, Share screen. Uh, this is a part of an article, uh, the outline of Marxist thought. It was written by uh, uh, Sun Tang Lee, who was a famous Marxist at, at the time. It was a serialized at uh, 37 times for two months. The contents was to introduce the basic prin uh, prin principles of Marxist thought. <clears throat> okay. 
some of, of Marx and Engels uh, were, uh, were translated at the time. The first translation of Marx's works was a handbook of historical materialism, a piece of true critic their politician economy in 1921. And the first uh, uh, translation of Engels's works, The Development of Socialism from Utopia to Science, was published in 1925. Hmm. Uh, this, this, uh, this, the right side of the screen is advertisement, adver advertisement of the first translation Engels' work in 1962. Uh, <clears throat> Rosa Luxemburg's thought was also introduced on April 1, uh, 1924, in Gap, Gap Yop, uh, there was an article, Life of uh, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. This article introduced the uh, life of them, pay homage to their struggles against imperialism and argues that uh, the use on the Japanese colon, colonial rule should honor their spirit. Korean researchers uh, attempt, attempt to, to study the theory of uh, Luxembourg. For example, in 1929, Mungyu Bach theoretically analyzed the capital accumulation theory of Luxembourg and Bruharin. Also, Namun Beck uh, denied the, uh, the underconsumption theory of Luxembourg. The recession at the time was made in the uh, dimension of a theoretical and practical analysis of capitalism and imperialism as a as a means to break through Japanese imperialism. However, Japanese colonial authorities had continued to suppress Marxism. They conducted censorship, such a procedure, and evolution of the daily newspaper or magazines. <clears throat> and the second stage, after <clears throat> liberation from Japanese imperialism, Marxism often discussed. The most important book was the first translation of Marxist capital. Chapter Volume 1 and 2 were translated Yong Chul Che, Sok Tam John, and Dong Ho uh, between 1947 and 1948. Uh, this, is, this is the translation of Capital. It was published by Seoul Publisher. About uh, 20,000 copies were estimated to be printed and sold uh, for volume one. The first uh, translation. However, this tra uh, translation failed to include volume three as the translator fled to North Korea when the separate and communist government of uh, uh, Sungman Mi established in south part of Korean peninsula in uh, 1948. Despite, uh, uh, despite the, the incompleteness, this translation was significant in that it was the first Korean translation of capital. <clears throat> However, at that time, Luxembourg's works did not attract much attention. Perhaps the main reason was the, uh, the uh, worker, Workers' Party of South Korea was greatly influenced by Leninism and Stalinism. Moreover, uh, the first spring of Marxism was short-lived in three years. Therefore, there was not much time for her work to be introduced and spread. Marxism was also uh, exterminated by the Korean War. Also, it was one of the big targets in a long period of uh, uh, military and dictatorship. But student movement activists pay attention to Marxism. They resist the uh, military dictatorships and launched the movement to solve co contradictions of Korean society. They introduced Marxism, all, although it became individualized and fragmented. One of the reasons was the strong suppression of Jung uh, Ibang military dictatorships. Uh, this is a very interesting case. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the repression at the times was very serious. For example, the book of uh, Ingno Gim, professor of economics at Jungang uh, University, was prosecuted uh, because his book was printed on May 1st, 
and published on May uh, 5th. The printing day was, uh, was May Day, and the pub public uh, publication day, date was Marx's first, first day. Very uh, serious uh, case. <clears throat> Luxembourg's thought was also interested fragmentally. There were, uh, there were uh, barely articles and books that introduced her theory. This is because Lux uh, Luxembourg's theory was out of interest or suppressed. In sum, on the challenge of Marxism, Korean inter intellectuals deteriorated it in 1950s, criticized it negatively in 1960s, and took a silence, silent attitude to it in 1970s. As a result, introduction of Marxism became marginalized. This, this, this was a misfortune, unfortunate. However, because many students and movement activists who were active in the 1970s had participated in various movements in 1980s, it might be dominant, but not a break. Since the uh, 1980s, many Korean people participated in the democrat, uh, democratization movement and the labor movement. Also, this period was the was that of resistance and struggles against the soul. Marxism played the, an important role in this uh, process. In the history of Marxism's reception, this period was the second spring of Marxism. One of the future in the uh, 1980s was a translation of, Mar uh, of Marxist and Engels' original text, especially uh, 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 a completely translation of capital. The second spring of Marxism culminated with the translation and the publication of Capital. On the other hand, it was uh, one of the most important uh, events that Marxism research has been uh, appointed as a professor in university. Marxism-related lectures was offered at major universities, and the lectures were particularly popular with the Korean students. The strong suppression of a military dictatorship still have gone on. on. Marxism, uh, recent, recent of the 1980s, was a historical event. Marxism gained its citizenship and was introduced to many people. In, in the 1980s, Luxembourg thought was actively accepted. At the time, he focused on introducing his life highlighting her as a revolution who uh, fought against the mainstream imperialism, mainstream of imperialism and the Social Democratic Party. In addition, with regard to her economic theory, her uh, major theory was review. After the 1990s, the recession of uh, Luxembourg was further expanded and the research gradually have included. included. <clears throat> what is important in uh, Luxembourg's reception since the 1919 uh, is that her original text ha has been translated. For example, Russian Revolution in 1989, the mass strike theory in 1995, and social reform or Re revolution in 2002 was translated. Finally, in 2013, uh, her main work the, the accumulation of capital was translated. In the academic world, various studies on uh, Luxembourg have been presented. In 1991, uh, Gabion Mi received his uh, doctorate in Northern Luxembourg theory of capital accumulation. He also published a, very, a variety of papers, including Luxembourg's political philo philosophy, uh, democracy, and so socialist issues, uh, national issues, a revolution of practice view on the uh, Russian Revolution and the Council Movement. Since the uh, 1990s, uh, research of, uh, uh, researches of Luxembourg has different. More the translation of his major works laid the, the foundation for a deep study of her uh, thought. In particular, the pub publication of Korean translation of uh, uh, Luxembourg's main work, uh, The Accumulation of Capital, can be evaluated as a historical event related to the recession of uh, uh, Luxembourg in Korea. The, finally, I will um, 
uh, provide the significance of uh, uh, Luxembourg's lip section. Uh, the history of uh, <coughs> Luxembourg's lip section has gone along with the history of Marxism in Korea. However, her thought did not occupy the main place in the development of Marxism. The reason uh, as follows. The firstly, firstly, the mainstream of Marxism in Korea place important on the ideas of Marx and Lenin. Thus, Luxembourg theory tended to be regarded as a departure from orthodox Marxism. Secondly, Marxist, uh, Marxist crisis theory in Korea has formed a mainstream position emphasizing the tendency to the rate of profit to fall. Accordingly, Luxembourg crisis uh, theory was criticized as the, as the uh, theory of uh, uh, underconsumption. Thirdly, Luxembourg's theory of imperialism was also not in the limelight. As Korean experience, a uh, colonial under Japanese imperialism, her theory might have received attention, attention, but it was interpreted as the theory of automatic breakdown. Finally, Luxembourg's works uh, were only translated after the 1980s, and even her main works was translated in 2013. Due to the uh, delay, her, her ideas uh, were not fully communicated to the general public as well as academics, and active discussion were not held. <clears throat> Despite many uh, limitations, uh, Luxembourg thought have made an important contribution to the history of Korean Marxism. The uh, significance of it uh, was that it inspired many people to over overcome the contradictions of capitalism through theory and the practice. Thus, uh, what Lenin said in memory of Luxembourg still has an important meaning. In other words, despite uh, uh, numerous uh, errors, she is an eternal eagle. An eagle can fly low like a chicken, but a chicken cannot fly high like an eagle. What we need to learn from her uh, is, is the task that this uh, eternal eagle, which appeared in the history of Marxist development, uh, encountered the uh, reality of the, the day and was trying to solve it. This will be the source of inspiration from Luxembourg in the process of overcoming capitalism and uh, transforming the reality we face today. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Professor Sibok Chang, for this uh, very well informed and analytical presentation on Rosa Luxembourg's mm -hmm. impact on Korea. Uh, in fact, there are, till now, there are two questions. I think one question that has been raised, well, that answer uh, has already been given uh, by the speaker. The question was that, uh, I'm just giving the, in a, in a summary form, that is the, uh, the uh, yes, the question is that he, he is curious to know that whether the Korean translations uh, of Rosa Luxemburg, they were Japanese translations or were they translated from the original German? Uh, uh, I think the answer has been given because, and it's very, uh, very useful and I think very significant that all the trans uh, translations of Rosa Luxemburg in Korean, they were made from the original German text. And uh, he wants to know one thing, I think that is, uh, that, that is very relevant for Professor Sibok Chang to answer. That is, he is curious if the history of these translations is documented. This is the question. Uh, per, uh, I will answer the first question. Hmm. Uh, as Korea is a divided country, mm -hmm. it is difficult to influence each other due to the lack, lack of academic and movement exchanges. So, uh, so uh, internationally, Lord uh, Luxembourg thought about uh, internationalism uh, uh, couldn't uh, couldn't not uh, affect uh, the 
the, between the South Korea and the North Korea. Okay. Then, <clears throat> and then second, is second uh, uh, the uh, uh, first translation of Marxist and Engels' works in Korea in the uh, 1920s uh, uh, translate the Japanese uh, 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 books. Uh, okay, not original uh, German, but uh the capital the first translation of capital use uh, uh the original german uh edition uh uh, uh, uh edition yes. Yes. okay uh, uh, and there is another question has there been any impact of Rosa Luxemburg's thinking of internationalism or the unification of the two Koreas? Have you, have uh, you got uh, one? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, many, many Korean people uh, want to un unify the, the, the two uh, Korea, uh, but uh, all, all issues, uh, uh, government sees uh, all issues. So, uh, 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 there are uh, uh, little, little impact on uh, Luxembourg to think, think of uh, uh, international reason. Okay. 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 Uh, next time, I, I, I'll see you. Yes. And I ask. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, uh, let me invite our, our fourth and last panelist, uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar. Uh, he is a, a member of the faculty of the Department of Psychology, South Asian University, New Delhi, India. Uh, he will speak on Rosa Luxemburg and the pedagogy of revolution, uh, reflections in the context of the Indian left. So uh, over to Dr. Ravi Kumar for his presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Sobhanlal. Um, as the title uh, indicates, uh, what I'm going to do in next 15 minutes uh, is I'm trying to locate, uh, though in the written paper, there are examples which I don't want to uh, read out completely. Uh, from uh, specifically two examples uh, from the Indian left. And when I'm saying Indian left, I'm primarily uh, focusing on the parliamentary left. Uh, though when references about uh, the fight for survival, uh, which I think one may disagree with what I'm saying, but I think the Indian left is uh, engaged in a fight for survival. And that fight for survival is not very specific to only the parliamentary left, but to the all variants of left. Uh, and that uh, the other context of the Indian left is also the fact that there is an increasingly uh, tendency of uh, absence of any distinction between uh, the left and what I would term the liberals. And it's, it's very, very difficult today to uh, make that distinction. What this paper uh, wants to do is it wants to look at the idea of pedagogy itself, though this is a terminology which has not been used in the works of Rosa, but that is how the work specifically uh, in course of uh, uh, preparing for this uh, talk I looked at uh, reform or revolution and the mass strike uh, pieces. So this word is not exactly used in these uh, two pieces, the, the, the word pedagogy, but I am using it because what Rosa is talking about is about pedagogy itself. And pedagogy here when I'm using is largely uh, an act which is political in itself. And it's an act 
which encompasses everything. And when I say everything, it means everything. So every act has a meaning. Every act makes an effort at teaching and learning something. That act also is an act which is involved in something uh, which, and for that I will go back to uh, somebody uh, called Paulo Freire, uh, wherein the idea of dialogue becomes very, very essential. And all these things are looked at primarily in context of the left politics here. So number one, it would consider pedagogy as political. Uh, it considers socio-political movements as sources of pedagogy. And here, the socio-political movement includes the political parties. And it asks a question without basically asking it directly whether the political parties are really aware of this aspect, this aspect of uh, movement as a source of pedagogy. Uh, my reading says that they are not really aware of this. Politically, if one looks at this idea of pedagogy as politics or vice versa, there is a dialectics between the two. Uh, it largely refers to the workings of the organization or the party. It is largely about the relationship between the party organization and the people or the masses. On one hand, on the other, it is about the relationship within the party itself and relationship one, when one is talking about this relationship is largely addressed in terms of dialogue and conversation between different players uh, within, uh, within the party. Now, I'm not saying something out of the blue. So in, in, in course of dealing with all this, there are obviously very, very classic issues involved, classic issues of democratic centralism, classic issues about processes of decision-making within the party, classical issues of institution versus institutionalization and what does it do, debates around vanguardism and so on and so forth. But because of the limited time frame, I'm not going to get into those, uh, some of those uh, aspects, but basically trying to raise questions in the context. Now, what I'm saying is not something which is out of the blue. I'm not saying, this is not my discovery. In fact, in 2011, June 11, 12, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of India Marxist, after it lost elections in West Bengal, it passed a resolution. And in that resolution, it said, and I'm quoting it, it said the organizational aspect is also an important factor. The image of the party among the people has been dented by manifestations of high handedness, bureaucratism, and refusal to hear the views of people. The existence of corruption and wrongdoing among a small strata of party leaders and cadres due to the corrosive influence of being a ruling party and running the government for a prolonged period was also resented by the party, by the people. All these have affected the party in the elections. The erosion of support amongst the working class and the rural and urban poor indicates the failing to consistently take up the class issues. The independent role of the party and the mass organizations was impaired due to the dependence on the administration. Now, this is something which is very, very interesting, which also opens up a whole lot of possibilities to debate about party replicating the state and party replicating not only the structures of the state, but also ways of the working of the state. And this state obviously is a capitalist state. And I think uh, that the party was becoming aware of. So there are instances of this kind, there have been in 2020 in context of another province in India, Bihar went through elections and there were a lot of issues around how the electoral alliances with the bourgeois forces was forged between the left and the bourgeois political parties. Sections within the left parties were not, at least one party was not very happy with the way all these processes were followed. Now, so there is something which is happening on the ground. And it is that concrete context that really throws up questions that uh, necessitates bringing of Rosa's understanding. Because what one is going to do is one is going to look at the question of intellect, intellectualism, uh, the, 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 
positioning of different bodies and leaders within the party vis-a-vis -vis the cadres and so on and so forth. Now, I am saying that there is an understanding today that remains entrenched within the liberal intellectual tradition that privileges the institutional form of knowledge production over non-institutional forms of knowledges. In other words, this privileging not only creates knowingly or unknowingly a hierarchization of knowledge, classes affording the institutional accessibility in a commodified economy have a better understanding compared to the masses who toil and face the everyday realities. Now, this kind of privileging leads an intellectual uh, to say, and I'm quoting him, he writes in a, in, in, in a, uh, in a national newspaper, he says, in democracies, people take decisions, but they do not have the intellectual wherewithal to examine the claims of the powers which seek their consent to rule them. Academics with their long engagement with knowledge have the tools to test the political and policy promises offered to the people. They must share it with the public to help them take informed decisions. Now, this understanding of people without the ability to comprehend the society has permeated even organizations where the participation of people has been passivized through turning them into masses led by intellectuals and leaders. Hence, there is a decision taken in a higher body of the institution called party, which is then transmitted down to the lowest level as a circular for an activity. What this does, is similar to what Freire called banking education. And Freire says that in the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. Now, and very interestingly, when I, when talking about the circular, uh, it, and obviously Freire was not writing in a context of this kind, he's not talking about the left organizations, but it, it sounds so relevant to when one is talking about the left organizations. He uses the word that he, he says, the teacher does not want to communicate. Communicating is a dialogic process, but the teacher issues communiques. Now this communique is what is the circular today in the party form. Dialogue is about transforming the world and it happens between and among humans in the concrete material conditions. So Freire's idea of dialogue needs to be seen as something which is far more radical and revolutionary. Now, the practice that the left has had in India does not seem to reflect that. Rosa Luxemburg, if we bring her in, understood that theoretical knowledge was important basis. So she was not saying that intellectuals have the responsibility to teach the masses. It is not saying the lead, she is not saying that the leaders will teach the cadres. Rosa understood that theoretical knowledge was important basis of the modern labor movement. And it is doubly important for the workers. While dealing with opportunism of Bernstein, she was clear that the working class needs to understand this aspect of politics. And she says, the present theoretical controversy with opportunism. It is not simply in the context of countering Bernstein's opportunism that Rosa was talking about theoretical knowledge of working class. She emphasizes that, and I quote, as long as theoretical knowledge remains the privilege of a handful of intellectuals in the party, it will face the danger of going astray. Only when the great mass of workers take in their own hands the keen and dependable weapons of scientific socialism will all the petty bourgeois inclinations, all the opportunist currents come to naught, quotes close. Rosa is linking the struggle for democracy with the struggle for emancipation of the working class. Unless the two are linked, democracy cannot be attained. When one looks at the contemporary situation, there seems a gradual disconnection between the two wherein the struggle for emancipation of the working class appears to have no connection with the struggle for democracy. Hence, a close look at the discourse on state repression, attack on dissenting voices, reveals a snapped connection between the discourse and the working class struggle. So she says, and I'm quoting her again, democracy acquires greater chances of survival as the socialist movement becomes sufficiently strong. Sorry. 
becomes sufficiently strong to struggle against the reactionary consequences of world politics and the bourgeois desertion of democracy. He who would strengthen democracy must also want to strengthen and not weaken the socialist movement. And with the renunciation of the struggle for socialism goes that of both the labor movement and democracy. She is talking about a notion of proletariat, which again seems completely absent when, when one looks at the contemporary context. Communicating the fact that the struggles of the working class, struggles within the university campuses or in the streets outside are struggles against the bourgeoisie, which acquires different forms in course of history. This struggle is also about equipping the working class with tools of dialectics and with an understanding that there is a relationship between the different struggles that the workers wage, as all of them are battles against the rule of capital. It is with the sword of dialectics that the, and she says, the, it is with the sword of dialectics that the proletariat pierces the darkness of its historical future, the intellectual weapon with which the proletariat, though materially still in the yoke, triumphs over the bourgeoisie, proving to the bourgeoisie its transitory character, showing it the inevitability of the proletarian victory. Now, this whole, I, I will try to wrap it up. My time is getting over. I think what she's trying to indicate is about doing away with this distinction, changing the notion of how we look at the working class, looking at the struggle that the working class wages not simply a struggle which is very classically and stereotypically limited to certain forms. And I think that notion of the working class, the relationship that the party and the cadre, the relationship that the party and the masses should have is completely absent in today's context, which Roja was trying to emphasize. And unless and until that relationship is forged, we will continue to have this situation in this country wherein you will have attacks on universities, you will have attacks on dissent, but there is no mass movement coming up. But rather, you are also simultaneously facing a situation of decimation of the left. And this really uh, provides us an opportunity to revisit the ideas and conceptualizations of Rosa along all these lines of conceptualizing the proletariat and the relationship of the proletariat in the larger context of the social movements. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ravi Kumar. Uh, maybe we will get questions uh, a little later, but uh, uh, here are two questions uh, which came earlier uh, uh, for uh, Professor Kretke. So I am putting these questions to you. Uh, one question is, th these two questions are for uh, Professor Gretke. Uh, yes, 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 one question is, you said that she didn't take into account the rivalries between European countries, but she states in the book that imperialism is the stage of capitalism where colonies are being disputed between developed countries, between developed countries in the world stage. If you could comment, this is, one question. So after you respond, I will give you the second question. Yeah. Okay, you're right. She's mentioning that uh, in a rather premature way because she's never really outlined imperialism as a stage. Uh, there is no periodization, no theorization of the history of capitalism in the whole book. My point is there is a straightforward core argument in the book, which is based upon an intrinsic, according to Rosa Luxemburg, an intrinsic problem of the capitalist accumulation process. And she thinks, and she argues also in a later polemic about the book, no one else, none of the other Marxists has ever before seen that. So she thinks her approach is much more fundamental than all the others who are, uh, well, superficial, who have dealt more or less already with political clashes between rivaling powers. They are, as many others did, regard imperialism just as a policy. 
hmm? a specific kind of policy waged by uh, capitalist powers and according, for instance, by Hilferding, um, following the interests, largely speaking, of finance capital, which is disputable and had been disputed already. So if you look at the theoretical core, the structure of a book, the rivalries that, she, you're right, she doesn't mention them, but the rivalries, political rivalries between the great powers play no role whatsoever. Okay? Okay. Now, now there is another question for you. Uh, yeah. The question is, the accumulation of capital is her magnum opus. Yes. How, how do we now analyze the accumulation of capital, not only in the capitalist countries like USA, Britain, et cetera, but by also the socialist country like China, especially spending on military and export of capital in global South, such as Africa. Yeah, well, th that is of course a problem that Rosa Luxemburg never addressed. Uh, China in its present form uh, is a hybrid, you might say. It is clearly a capitalist economy an expanding one even on a world scale. So it's, it's one of the biggest players and probably the world power of the second half of the 21st century. Uh, but it still has officially a political structure and a political, let's say theory, predominant theory that is socialist. So the long-term uh, goal of all the uh, actions of the uh, Communist Party in China is still something like what they call a market socialism, though again, a hybrid form. Uh, they are, of course, you could say, acting as a big power, investing and building up as previously uh, European imperialist powers also did, in Africa, not only in Africa, also in Central Asia, they're building up infrastructures because they are a world trading power. And if you want to keep up world trade, you need a network of uh, ports of, well, uh, you have to be present uh, uh, in the different parts of the world. And that is exactly what China does. There's nothing new in the history of modern capitalism. All the big powers, the world trading powers, have acted like that. You can do it softly. You just have embassies. You just have uh, uh, consuls, as they call it, consulates in different parts of the world. Or you do it uh, with a little bit more impact. You are building, you are supporting, you are building as the Chinese do very, very successfully. One cannot deny that you're building up big infrastructures like railroads, like ports. Uh, so they are, I wouldn't say they are invading as the, the, the Western press in particular, the European press is always demonizing China, which is nonsense, absolute nonsense. Uh, they are doing what other powers, capitalist powers have also done in the past and whether this would be uh, the starting point or a help in future socialist transformations is completely open to question. Uh, it depends on how they deal with their partners in different parts of the world. And sometimes they do this perfectly well and sometimes you can criticize them in many respects. They have clashes as a big power, for instance, with a neighboring also rising third world power uh, uh, India. They have had it uh, and they probably will still have it in the near future. Uh, but nonetheless, as long as they are not invading other countries, not waging war against other countries, which they don't so far, uh, you could still say, well, this hybrid structure, this political ideas of this political theory of socialism still has an impact upon Chinese policy. Well, China is a very complicated uh, matter and uh, one should deal with it uh, at length and in, let's say, better in a larger, longer panel session than just in a short question-answer exchange. 
So, so far. Yes. Uh, Otherwise, I start you. talking for hours. <laughs> <problems. laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, finally, there are three questions, but we don't have much time left anyway. Uh, three questions for uh, Ravi Kumar. One question. Uh, is yeah, I can. I, 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 should I read myself and it will okay, take okay. time? Okay, okay, yes, yes. Please, 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 uh -huh. please. So please. Uh, about the first question from Ananya uh, about Ananya the Basu, yes. yeah, Indian parliamentary left, uh, whether they are in reality ruining the communist movement and thereby. See, I, uh, I have a little different position on this. I don't want to blindly uh, go and talk about Indian parliamentary left ruining the possibilities of a communist movement. But as I was trying to indicate, there can and there is still possibility of how are we going to have really a serious introspection because even within the parties, it's not that there have not been, but they are very minor debates on issues of democratic centralism, et cetera, et cetera. So redefinition, re-looking at the idea of the party itself, uh, rather than within the very classical sense. And I was looking at the constitution of this communist parties that also need to be revisited in certain senses. So, because the times have changed, the times have changed and times have changed in different ways. So I would still not wholesale put the blame on the parliamentary aspect of it, yes, because they are no longer the left have largely, there is hardly any way to distinguish between their politics and let's say the politics or the policies uh, or the political discourse that they want to further on on another liberal bourgeois political formation. Yes, because of that, I will definitely say that uh, that has impacted the left. About the second question, I don't think uh, Indian left is in a position to turn back Modi's offensive uh, uh, simply because Indian left is, it, it, it's, so weakened that it cannot. Um, so uh, the possibilities need to be really looked at in terms of trying to look at how uh, one can really strengthen the left first. Uh, it, and I think it has to begin from ground zero right now. Um, and there are, I don't have time, but one could have talked about the kind of possibilities that are there. Uh, I think Rosa's work does provide us opportunity and uh, a lot of uh, material to really rethink the practices of the left today. Uh, uh, and uh, we need to engage with her. Uh, there is a lot of discontent and what we see today in form of the students struggling uh, in different universities that also if you have seen due to the pandemic has now quietened down or the historic farmers protests, which is out there today, they, what, what has happened is it does indicate towards a lot of discontent which is out there, but that discontent is not taking form of, or the left is not really capable on account of 100 different reasons to really make an entry into that, uh, that kind of discontent. Um, lastly, how is Luxembourg's pedagogy aligned or not aligned with parliamentary state communist parties in India and China. I, I can tell you about India and that is the effort that I was trying to uh, make. CPM's uh, resolution in the central committee is, itself points to certain problems which uh, emerged and which became part of the party. Uh, 2020 certain uh, issues came to light about the way that the political parties were working. And I think that is largely because the left does not uh, have the kind of understanding of the working class uh, today, the way that Luxembourg was trying to point out. Uh, or the left does not really uh, today uh, talk, uh, even think in terms of how is it going to redefine uh, its own workings within the party and vis-a-vis -vis the masses. And Luxembourg can be useful in that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ravi Kumar, for responding to all the questions. In fact, we have uh, more or less uh, finished our question answer session. And in the time remaining, uh, I will uh, very uh, briefly, because this is uh, the 
responsibility of the chair on such academic occasions uh, to uh, sum up uh, the points that have been raised in the symposium. So one by one, let me take up. I will just uh, very briefly uh, and quickly uh, summarize and uh, try to make some observ observations on the uh, four uh, papers presented here. Uh, in the first presentation, Michel Gretke uh, has primarily focused on Rosal Kimbo's classic text, The Accumulation of Capital, written in 1913. And I think what has come out of his presentation is that despite uh, many of her shortcomings in the book, despite the fact that uh, some of her observations on colonialism, imperialism in the last uh, part of the book, a rather uh, fragmentary, uh, somewhat superficial. Despite all these things, there are two very important points uh, in Rosa Luxembourg's text, which deserve attention today in the 21st century. One is that uh, Rosa Luxembourg was one of the first theoreticians of Marxism, even before Lenin's uh, text on imperialism came out, uh, that capitalism for its survival requires footprints in the non-capitalist world uh, for its own reproduction, for its own survival, for its own sustenance. Uh, it has to uh, appropriate the non-capitalist world. This is first. Second, despite plunder and loot of the non-Western world, uh, it becomes difficult actually for the metropolitan countries to transform these non-capitalist societies in such a way that the surplus arising out of capital accumulation in the metropolitan countries would be very easily absorbed by them. And there are two reasons for that. One is that the, these societies uh, do not perhaps need these uh, commodities uh, which uh, are supposed to come from the West to the East because they have their own civilization, they have their own cultural values, and they are broadly in their own way self-sufficient. They have their own self-sufficient economy. Mm. This is one reason. The second reason is even if the uh, non-Western countries, the non-capitalist countries require them, need them. They just lack the economic power to buy them. So okay. this is, this is uh, Michelle, a uh, great yeah, case. I agree. Very good. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. The second is uh, Professor uh, Ziong Min's observation. I think this very interesting point. And there, <clears throat> I, I think a very <clears throat> crucial question, in fact, that is the focal point of her paper. That is, notwithstanding loyalty to a revolutionary cause, the space for dissent, recognition of the voice of difference, is the hallmark of an intellectual. The intellectual uh, uh, voice of difference that has got to be recognized, and that has been that was expressed, for example, uh, in Rosa Luxemburg's assessment of the Russian Revolution. That, despite the fact that she extended her full support to the uh, cause of Russian revolution mm -hmm. to the Bolsheviks. She also agreed to differ uh, uh, with the way uh, Lenin and Trotsky tried to build up the Soviet state in its early years. And uh, so th th this, is, this is a question centering around the issue which she raised in her paper, that is intellectuals and ideology. That is despite being loyal to an ideology, I must uh, have the autonomy to question uh, the fault lines in that ide ideology if uh, I think so. The second, this was uh, her, her paper. Sibok, Professor uh, Sibok Chang's paper, I, I, I found very, very informative, very, very useful. Uh, and I think. Uh, Two very important questions, uh, very issues have been raised by 
Professor Sibok Singh. Obviously, for lack of time, this could not be elaborated as it happens uh, everywhere. That is, Rosa Luxembourg uh, did not take off in Korea in a very big way. One reason for many reasons, and one reason, of course, was military leadership, the war, et cetera, et cetera. But another reason, I think, and that is a very important factor, the ideological reason, that is Rosa Luxemburg in Korea was viewed through the Soviet lens. The, that is the typical Stalinist frame, which actually ruled uh, international communist movement for uh, so many years, for so many decades. And that led to her marginalizations in the uh, Korean uh, mainstream left circles. And one very important thing is, I think, uh, that, 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 that was in a, in a way a very decisive document which shaped the future of uh, Comintern and international communist movement. That is uh, Stalin's uh, very famous letter of 1931 in uh, Revolutia, where actually Stalin uh, used the word Luxembourgism and uh, Luxembourgism, Luxembourg's ideology, this became a taboo uh, for, uh, for all communists. So uh, Luxembourg was, Rosa Luxembourg was virtually ostracized in, in the international communist movement. And that in a way uh, sealed the fate of Rosa Luxembourg, I would say not only in Korea, but in all countries, in, the, in our country, country like India also. In India also, the Indian left is hardly aware of Rosa Luxembourg's writings, her thoughts, her, her ideas, for the same reason. Because in India also, the official left in a way, its uh, destiny, its, uh, I, I, uh, its ideological orientation has been shaped by this, uh, st this uh, Stalinist frame. And in this Stalinist frame, actually, Rosa Luxemburg virtually had no, no space. So, and finally, Ravi Kumar, I think, has, uh, mm, uh, in fact, I, I missed one point that is uh, in uh, Professor Sibok Chang's. Uh, presentation, uh, there was another point he, he has raised, very, very important point. In, in fact, that point, in a way, can be linked with Ravi Kumar's uh, discussion also. That is how Rosa Luxemburg can act as a weapon in the struggle for democracy in South Korea. And that point, in fact, is Ravi Kumar's last point. Uh, and Ravi Kumar has raised three very, very important points. One is that uh, in Rosa Luxemburg's a number of writings, Stagnation and Progress in Marxism, written in 1903, chapter eight of, of Unis pamphlet, 1913, the, on the Spartacus program, 1918, in her numerous letters, which are now available. A point that has been repeatedly stressed by Rosa Luxemburg, and that is, I think one of the central points of Ravi Kumar's uh, uh, paper, that is uh, the, if the socialist revolution is the dream, then the working masses, they have to be culturally enlightened, the cultural enlightenment of the masses. This, this in fact reminds one of Antonio Gramsci also, the same, same question, the same strategy. That is, you have to culturally empower yourself. So that is one very, very important point. The second important point is that this leader mass difference uh, gap, uh, how that gap has to be bridged. And I think that again reminds one of Antonio Gramsci's focus on organic intellectuals. Unless you can build up organic intellectuals in your party, uh, it, it becomes, this, this gap uh, somehow uh, will remain. But there is one point, I, I, I also do not know, know the answer to this question, that yes, it is true that Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg also shared this, this point. That is, uh, if the masses uh, have to be enlightened, and for that culturally enlightened, uh, intellectually, uh, they have to train themselves, if that be so, if that be the agenda, to the point is, that is it possible for the masses to uh, 
culturally enlighten themselves, uh, say, to empower themselves with a very powerful ideology like Marxism without any agency? Is it possible to just uh, possible for them to uh, do it on their own? I, I also do not know, know the answer. And, and that perhaps brings in the question of organic intellectual. And the third point, I think, as I said, that uh, th this is the point raised by uh, Professor Sivok Chang also. Uh, that is, yes, the struggle for democracy and the struggle for emancipation of the working class. I would say, I would add just one point, not only just emancipation, but self-emancipation of the working class and the struggle for democracy. These two issues have to be linked. These have to be strengthened. Uh, so unless this is done, unless this is uh, put on the agenda of the uh, Indian left, not only Indian left, but left across the world, uh, I think uh, the problem uh, remains unsettled. So with these words, our time is almost over. I would uh, like to wrap up this session by uh, offering a vote of thanks. Uh, my thanks uh, go to all the four panelists. They have uh, uh, cooperated uh, excellently by maintaining very strictly the time frame. I didn't have to uh, uh, undertake the this unpleasant uh, job of giving them the signal that and telling them that your time is over. So this I did not have to do. My uh, thanks go to all the viewers uh, who have watched this program. And I think it has been a very, for me at least, it has been a very, very uh, uh, rich and rewarding experience to be a participant in this program. Uh, and my special thanks go to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, which has extended all its mm -hmm. support to the International Rosa Luxemburg Society. Uh, and finally, uh, to Lauren Balhorn and Vivke Weishausen and their team who have uh, extended excellent <clears throat> infrastructural support to make this program a success. And with that, I wrap up this session. Uh, goodbye to everybody. Auf Wiedersehen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.